Welcome. This is Beck Barnes and Jim Stebman of Cotton Grower Magazine, and we are coming at you from the chilly Cotton Grower Studios here in Memphis, Tennessee, or at least it's been chilly. We are thawing out after uh, the freeze that de- descended on us uh, last week. Um, I know it descended on just about all of y'all. So, so yeah, let me get to this. Whether you are joining us from Winter Garden, Texas, or Coldwater, Mississippi, or any other cold locale, we thank you for chilling with us this week. Uh, I am joined by, as always, by my main man, Jim Stebman. Howdy, Jim. Hello, Beck, and welcome to the the chilliest room here in our little suite of offices. This, you know, today. Yeah, just to provide some color for y'all, I am in my puffer coat, my down jacket, uh, <laughs> as we are inside it's three in the afternoon. And, I, and honestly, it's actually probably fifty degrees outside today. But uh, we are in a big office building where they tinker with the thermostat and uh when you are uh, I, I tell people all the time i come from a tropical people i came from the, the <laughs> tropical mississippi delta i don't do cold weather um so anyhow uh we are back in office this week as we begin the week of november 18 uh today and uh a week ago today i was actually in literal frozen milwaukee wisconsin checking in on uh, a media agency of one of our magazine's clients and I will tell y'all, if you are familiar with the television program Game of Thrones, I was literally north of the wall last week. I mean, there were white walkers up there. I had <laughs> ice coming off my ears. Um, we nearly froze to death. I'll tell you the things that I do for this magazine and for y'all readers. So um, anyhow, I know it was cold all over. I'm probably preaching to the choir wherever you are in the cotton belt. Um, and so that's a timely uh, subject because we have some timely content on that topic today. But the first things first, uh, we want to bring you a short message from today's sponsors, Phytogen. Phytogen is pleased to sponsor the Cotton Companion, bringing you the latest news to help you thrive all season long. Okay, so uh, that is a timely Phytogen ad as always, because at this moment, we want to bring y'all a brief custom content segment featuring our very own custom editor, Robin Sickberg. She recently sat down and spoke with Dr. Chad Brewer, who is a phytogen cotton development specialist for the state of Arkansas and the Missouri Boot Hill. And uh, we're going to bring you that custom interview segment right now. Hello, I'm Robin Sipper, custom content editor for Meister Media Worldwide, publisher of Cotton Grower Magazine. I'm here again with Dr. Chad Brewer, Phytogen Cotton Development Specialist for Arkansas and the Missouri Boot Heel. In the last episode, we talked about the yield protection that Phytogen W3FE varieties offer against weeds, insects, and other pests. In today's segment, we're going to hear a bit about how the Phytogen W3FE varieties performed in the field this past season. But first of all, Chad, tell us about the season in your area. What kind of conditions did your growers face this year? You know, we started the year um, really with some intense rainfall, as everybody knows, I think the cool weather and rain really uh, led us into uh, two different planting days. So we had an early crop and then a break for the rain and then a later planting crop. And I think you, whenever you start harvesting the, the, the fields and the, my plots, you can really tell the difference between the early planting and the late. One thing that we noticed was that uh, seedling vigor um, made a huge impact on the crop this year. Um, high vigor uh, varieties really fared pretty well um, during that cool wet period. How did the Phytogen W3FE varieties um, yield this year? Uh, Again, a great question because, you know, we had those two different planting windows and then we got into some significant rainfall, you know, pretty timely rainfall throughout the growing season. So overall we had a, had a good growing season and then, and then, you know, a really, really warm August and September. And I think that August and September is really what brought this uh, whole cotton crop around. So in that in that environment, the phytogen varieties did very well. Phytogen 3B07 was a standout. So that's an experimental line. Then also phytogen 430 and 350 fared very well as well. So I think those three um, did exceptionally well in uh, 2019. What specifically would you recommend for as far as varieties for the mid south? In the mid south, I think uh, phytogen 3B07 is going to be a big player. You know, it's got great yield potential, a very broad area of adaptation excellent quality and um, I think that you know you combine all those things together with that breed, that breeding trait and wide strike three flex and list package and you got a really solid performer so I think that one's going to be at the top of my list phytogen 430 over the last several years has proven itself time and time again it has again good yield potential um, 
probably not as high a fiber quality as 3B07, but it certainly can put the pounds of pounds of lint in a picker. So that one's obviously going to be on my on my list. And then rounding it out will be a 350. Because it's got dual gene root knot resistance, it fits on a, a lot of uh, sandier acres. It's got good yield potential on the better ground as well. And um, I really like 350, I think, on some clay ground because it can get the plant height. So those will be my top three. Well, Chad, we have to wrap up. And uh, thank you, as always, for being on the program and for the information you've provided. And if growers have questions, please go to phytogen.com for more information. All right, a big old thank you to Robin and to Chad there. Uh, Jim, I don't know if I told you this. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I was up in uh, Milwaukee last week. Before that, I was in Chicago and uh, up there on business. But my wife and I came up a couple days early over the weekend and did some touristy stuff. And um, and froze to death. We, well, it was actually okay. It was about 40 <laughs> degrees when we were in Chicago over the weekend. But the first thing we did Saturday morning was uh, pop out to a little brunch spot called Yoke in downtown Chicago. And who do I bump into there but our uh, guest here, Dr. Chad Brewer. He was he and his wife <laughs> were in uh, this random brunch spot in downtown Chicago. Bumped into him, had a great chat with him. Uh, anyhow, so we thank Chad for uh, joining us here. And, man, just, just bump into cotton folks wherever you go uh, in, in the great United States. We, we are everywhere. Exactly, yeah. yeah so Absolutely. So anyhow, yeah, a thank you to Chad, a thank you to Robin, and we are going to get rolling on this, our 60th episode, kind of a milestone episode of the Cotton <clears throat> Companion. And uh, truly, I say this all the time, but it really is going to be a good one. We think we got a nice, juicy show for y'all. You're going to enjoy it. So uh, Jim is, uh, as always, going to lead our news segment. He's talking crop progress. He's talking MFP payments, which have been in the news. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, also, I mentioned some timely content. We're going to talk about what to do with your harvest equipment during these freezing temps, uh, how to best take care of that expensive piece of machinery you got out there uh, on your farm. So after that, we're going to bring you all an interview that Jim recently conducted with our oldest, bestest buddy, Dr. O.A. Cleveland. Uh, I believe, reading his most recent column, he's in some good spirits uh, due to some maybe some bullish market activity. He is feeling better, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Yeah, here. yeah, it's good to hear. So y'all don't want to miss that. I know that y'all will be interested in what he has to say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all right, Jim, before we jump in on your first topic, which I'll probably be crop progress, uh, I want to make a plea briefly to our listening audience. I want to ask you all a favor. Uh, we are just getting started on our annual cotton grower a cotton acreage survey, and we need y'all's expertise. Uh, we always conduct this thing at this time of year, every year. We come to market with the very first acreage projection for the upcoming crop year. That'll be for 2020. And uh, we do that by getting, again, y'all's help. So uh, what I'm asking you to do, go to cottongrower.com. You can see we just put a story up uh, announcing this survey today. Uh, today's the 18th. It should still be up if you visit the site at any point this week. It'll be on the homepage. Go to cottongrower.com. Look for that story about our acreage survey and click on a link there in, and we're asking you to take about a short, a very short five question ish, five ish question survey. And the main thing we're asking you to do is to give us your estimation of how many acres will be planted in your state in 2020. That's not on your farm. I know a lot of people kind of get turned off, don't want to tell us that, uh, what you might consider personal information about your personal acreage breakdown. We don't want that info. We want to know. What, how many acres you think will be in your state in the 2020 crop year. And to give you some context, if you take that survey, there will be a link there that'll show you how many acres were planted in your state in 2019. So that'll help you, you know, formulate that estimate that you, you will be thinking about. So again, it's very easy peasy and you'll be doing us a great favor and you'll be doing the industry a great favor. Again, we're the first to come to market with this thing. Jim here uh, is happy to toot our own horn as I am in that in 2019, our survey results, our data showed that there would be 13.62 million. Is that right? It's pretty close. Yep. And uh, the U six months later, USDA came out with their final planted acres, and it was 13.7 million. So gosh, we were, uh, what is that? Only eight eighty thousand. It was close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades. There Let's you go. Put it that way. We were very close. Not yes. not bad for an old old Miss boy who struggled with anything remotely involving math 
all throughout school. I was very proud of how close. And we some were. of us who were still using abacus in the, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> back in, in elementary school. So yeah. yeah. So yeah, we we were happy with that. But uh, really, y'all should be the ones patting yourselves on the back. Y'all that participated last year did such a good job. You know your states so well. Nobody knows it better than y'all do. So we ask for your help again this year. Okay, that's my. That was supposed to be short. It got got too long. <laughs> Uh, anyhow, Jim, I'm getting out of your way. Please tell us the news of the day. I will be happy to, Beck. Uh, first of all, hot off the press. Again comes most recent information from USDA's Crop Progress Report. This is for the week ending November 17th. And the numbers for cotton in this report once again focus exclusively on harvest. According to the report, 68% of the U.S. crop has now been harvested. That's a 6% increase in the past week and it's still 2% ahead of the five-year average for the date. That number's getting a little bit closer, but we're still ahead of, uh, of average. Every cotton-producing state continued to show percentage increases in harvest, with the biggest jumps coming in Kansas at 18%, Arizona, California, and Missouri all at 15%, and Virginia at 12%. And in all, nine of the cotton-producing states uh, are still running ahead of their respective five-year averages. So uh, we're getting close. We have, there are some states, obviously, that are well over 90% harvested. Uh, we have some that still have some catching up to do. We have some that just have a lot of acres uh, left, to, uh, left to run through, uh, through the picker or stripper. So uh, we'll um, keep watching those numbers here over the next couple of weeks and, and uh, see how close, how long it takes us to get to that 100% harvest. Uh, hopefully, I, I, I think it's supposed to be dry around here for the next week, um, and I'm assuming uh, that it'll be like that at least in the southeast. Hopefully, in a, you know, hopefully everywhere it's dry weather, smooth sailing from here uh, for the rest of the way, and everybody gets wrapped up. Gosh, we did a story two or three years ago about some farmer in Georgia who was still picking on Valentine's Day, and we don't we don't wish that on anybody. We want y'all to go ahead and get out of there and get that crop in. No, well, this and this report's the first one who really that really shows that Arizona and California have jumped into the mix yeah. in a big way. Uh, when you look at these high percentage increases uh, in the past week, that tells me you know they're they're ready to get those uh, those crops out of the field out there at last. Yeah. Uh, next, as Beck mentioned, uh, November fifteenth, uh, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue announced. The second tranche, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, are basically the second part of the 2019 market facilitation program payments, uh, with those payments are set to begin here just before Thanksgiving. That means that producers of uh, eligible commodities under the market facilitation program will now be able to receive 25% of the total payment expected, in addition to the 50% they already received from this program earlier this year. Now, shortly after the USDA announcement, the National Cotton Council issued a statement uh, extending its thanks to the Trump administration and USDA for moving ahead with the payment. And in that statement, NCC Chairman Mike Tate said the assistance is very timely, noting that lost market share to China and a slowdown in global cotton demand have contributed to a 30 cent per pound drop in cotton prices since summer of 2018. And figuring average yields, uh, that drop equates to about $250 less revenue per acre for cotton. Uh, The uh, National Cotton Council is continuing to urge USDA to proceed with facilitating the third part or the third payment, which the agencies indicated will represent another 25% of, uh, of the MFP program. USDA has indicated a January timetable for that payment but its initiation could be impacted by a potential phase one agreement with China. So uh, again, everybody's watching, uh, watching movement on that and uh, see where it goes and, and see if uh, that third and final payment will actually happen. Yeah, you wonder uh, what pencils out better for our guys at this point, a deal to be struck or a deal holding off in time for that third mm-hmm. payment to come through. You know, I mean, I... I I don't mean to make light of that in any way, but really, I mean, you know, if the deal gets struck, so many of the guys I talk to say, hey, man, I'd much rather be looking at a 70 cent market. Sure. You know, than anything else, but do we expect that market to recover that quickly? 
the day or, or the week or few weeks after a deal is announced. And that's and that's a that's a great question and a great setup for uh, for our discussion with OA okay, good, Cleveland yeah. here in a few minutes because he does have some opinions and thoughts on that. So well, uh, good. So stay tuned. We'll get there. Uh, as Beck has mentioned about uh, as he sits here still shivering. Um, Within the past week, a, a pretty strong and some might say miserable blast of Arctic air roared into the cotton belt, uh, just as many growers were preparing to finish harvest. And those sub-freezing temperatures raised a lot of questions about how to keep a picker's moisture system from freezing. And there were more than a few answers and suggestions for that flying across social media in the past week. One of the best articles that was written came from Tennessee Extension Cotton Specialist Tyson Raper who outlined several options for mixing methanol with water to lower the freezing point. We posted that article on cottongrower.com last week, and it was hands down the most viewed article uh, of the last seven days. Good information, as we know, always draws attention. And if you haven't had a chance to check out Tyson's article, I encourage you to do so, even if your harvest temperatures have now climbed above freezing at least for the time being. You'll find in that article several considerations for methanol use with water, including, as, uh, as you will see, a very strong reminder that methanol is highly flammable and should be handled with caution. There is a video demonstration attached to that article that's showing how the percentage of methanol impacts the freezing point of the mixture and also in increased potential flammability. And there's also a chart showing the freezing points of various methanol and water solutions. Uh, in addition, Tyson also reviewed several other options for protecting a uh, picker system from freezing at night. So if you're still working to finish this season's harvesting and with some typically unpredictable weather uh, generally on tap around Thanksgiving, uh, please check out the article on cottongrower.com. It's titled Prep Pickers for Use in Freezing Temperatures and Considering the Economics of This Year's Crop, the last thing you all need is a preventable problem with your uh, your picker or stripper. Yeah. Yeah, very timely stuff from uh, our old buddy Ty, Ray, Tyson Raper, so mm -hmm. we appreciate that. Yep. One last bit of information. Uh, our November issue is obviously out in mailboxes right now. I hope you have yours. Uh, and it does include articles on each of the major cottonseed companies. Article on Delta Pine, one on Americot, Phytogen, BASF, Stoneville and Fibermax, Dynagro, and Cropland. And each, each of those articles includes a look at some of the successes these companies have had this year, plus some preliminary info, and I will say very preliminary from a lot of cases, on varieties and technologies that may be coming for 2020. Each of those articles are currently available or will be within the next few days on cottongrower.com. So please check those out, especially as you're starting to begin your thoughts and, and plans for 2020. And that it's the news. Very good, Jim. I thank you for, for curating the news for us here uh, <laughs> on the Cotton Pod, on the Cotton Companion Pod. So uh, we do want to hold you there. We're going to bring to our listeners this OA Cleveland interview. <laughs> Again, uh, OA, one of our oldest and dearest friends. He's a great friend of the magazine and it has been quite a bit since we've heard from him. So uh, we are happy to do that now. OA is a Professor Emeritus of Economics at Mississippi State University, and we've already kind of hinted at a couple of the topics that he's going to touch on, so we can just jump right into that thing. We're happy to bring you Dr. O.A. Cleveland now. Welcome to this episode's Market Minute. Since we focused on industry topics other than the market for the last few episodes, we figured it was time to check back in to discuss what's happening with the market and prices. I'm joined again today by Dr. O.A. Cleveland, Professor Emeritus of Agricultural Economics at Mississippi State University. O.A., as always, thanks for taking time to catch up with us. Thank you so much. It's always my pleasure to talk with Cotton Grower. Well, we do appreciate that, uh, and, and certainly our listeners do as well. Uh, for the last month or so, the markets kind of continue to be pretty stagnant, I think, is is probably the best way to put it. Not a lot of price movement, not a lot of enthusiastic activity, uh, but that seemed to change uh, a week ago with USDA's uh, World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimate uh, for November. Uh, some of the numbers in that caught a lot of people in the industry by surprise, and, and, and that's in a good way. And I seem to recall your first comment on after seeing that report was, 
USDA killed the bear this week. Would you care to explain your thinking on that? Well, thank you. And yes, that's uh, to me. It's uh, it, it's uh, it's a point blank statement that, uh, in fact, is factual. And you know, why do I come to this conclusion? Though some people have called me ridiculous. First, uh, USDA reduced, uh, without getting into the specific countries, the world crop by in round numbers, some three million bales. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's a significant uh, change this early in the year. But even more significant than that was that major and significant changes were made in the world's four or five largest producing countries, which is all but unheard of. The U.S. had a significant reduction, uh, 900,000 bales. Uh, uh, They took 600,000 bales out of Pakistan, a half a million out of India, a half a million out of China. Uh, these are big numbers in the major producing states. And then they went over to Turkey, another principal uh, producer, and took 300 bales out, 300,000 bales out of there. These kinds of changes aren't made unless the market uh, is shocked from the supply side of the price equation. Now, granted, I've always said that uh, bull markets are formed by uh, out of demand statistics and demand numbers. And demand was really not touched in this report other than a mere 100,000 bale reduction in world demand. Mm -hmm. But uh, those numbers coupled all together left world ending stocks, again, in round numbers, some 3 million bales less than where we thought they were just a month ago. Down to 80 million bales and down to a, a level where we've seen 80 cent cotton with 80 million bales, 79 million bales. So uh, we were sitting at 62 cents, 64 cents, something like that. Uh, And with these major producing countries losing production, with major importing countries having also their production reduced, means that they will have to come for more exports. They'll have to come in from their, from their side more imports, but mm-hmm. it's built a case for more cotton to be exported around the globe. I guess the proper terminology would be world trade is going to increase, and that's always bullish for prices. Now, all those numbers are very positive, but it's certainly so that uh, there's major hurdles that are yet going to have to be cleared. Well, that, and that was my uh, that was my next question. You know, you just don't flush the bears out of the woods here with, you know, with one report. You know, what, what's lying ahead that we still have to get over? That's exactly right. We, we do have to call in the minister for the burial ceremony, but they're <laughs> digging the hole, and it's a deep one, in my opinion. This, 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 this bear is gone. It, it's not in the hibernation. We're going to have to wait another year or two to even birth another bear. So the bear is, is, is out of the picture for a while. But, you know, we have, uh, uh, we have some, some, some monumental work in the entire cotton industry to rebuild our cotton demand. Mm-hmm. We've let that slack. We've not attacked uh, consumer demand as we should have. We've allowed polyester to step in. We've not preached the sermon of give a gift of cotton today. Uh, and as a consequence, our demand has slipped. We've forgotten a little bit about sustainability. And it's not that I personally think sustainability sustainability should be a major part of cotton's program. But in one sense, it should because we do have a lump of consumers that are interested in sustainability. And when cotton is fighting, for its very life with synthetics, the total non-sustainable product, and we are giving way to letting them tell the world that they are sustainable in an entirely false uh, situation. We're dropping the ball by not attacking that. So we do have to preach more sustainability. And then we come to the idea that as we saw these uh, major changes, we had a a bit of a phenomenon in the market. Those changes came at the same time we were right smack dab in the middle of what's called the rolls, the long-only rolls, the Goldman Sachs rolls, the Jim Rogers rolls, Mm -hmm. uh, and and the rolls that we're going to complete right now. So the market is not going to move very far as all these spread trades are being made and thousands of spread trades are being made. So we've been caught in that, so the market's been 
the lock in, in that situation. Additionally, we also find that there is still a, a abnormally large amount of cotton around the globe, not just in the United States, that's not been priced. Uh, in my 40 years of this work, I don't remember ever going into this time of year with so little cotton that growers have already fixed a price on or have you are either in the cash market or the futures market. So there is a tremendous amount of selling that's going to have to be done. That's going to get done. The bills are going to take the cotton. So it's going to have to be priced, but there's so much in the near term that's going to have to be done. It acts as a as, as a as a retardant to higher prices. Mm-hmm. I think we're moving. Go ahead. I think go we're ahead. moving back to the '70s, but we've got to struggle. We got to pull some teeth. Well, and that was that was my next question on this. I know we 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 we're still kind of settled in that 62 to 64, 65 cent range at this point, uh, and it looks like with. You're, with the way you're describing it, yes, there is sort of a path there to get back to 70. We're not, are we? Are we? Are we kind of out of the woods in terms of dropping back below 60 at this point? Well, I think unequivocally, I believe we are absolutely. I have a couple of friends that think we could do that, but I simply do not see it. Mills that missed the boat of 61 cent cotton. Uh, 62 cent cotton, 63 cent cotton. I think if we show any tendency to drop below 64 cents, I think mills are going to start piling on in, in great magnitude to do pricing. Okay. So I think the mills are going, going to keep that correction there. I think that resistance down in that area is extremely strong. So looking at looking at where we are in, this, in, in the situation right now, and I know talking with growers, over the last couple months, as, as they you know, as harvest starts, and you kind of see where yields are, and they're good here, and they're not so great over here, uh, and people are starting to look a little bit at you know what are the other commodities going to do for next year. What does this call kind of mean for planted cotton acres next year? Well, I've been asking that question myself, <laughs> and that's something we want to know. But it's as we look at yields first off, mm-hmm. I think prices are most important. But I would say. Yields are the number one thing that growers look to, uh, given given prices have not totally fallen out of bed. We're looking at the red December, 68 cents, uh, 69 cents, 68, 67 plus. Uh, that's not what we want. There are more than a few growers that can make money at that level. Sure. Uh, but many have to have more than that. Uh, and then coupled with payments that, that are out there, uh, it, it, it's a it, it's it's a way to plant cotton, and if we look at the yields this year, and as we look at the the, the, the qualities before some of the rains and bad weather hit, mm-hmm. uh, I think growers will be very excited. Whether it be in North Carolina or throughout most of the Mississippi River Delta states, I think we will hold our own. North Carolina will increase. We'll have some increases in Mississippi and other Delta states. The uh, the big rub, of course, is Texas, but uh, they're, they're they're limited in what they can grow. I, they're very disappointed with their cotton. They're very emotional about that disappointment. They say they're going to plant Milo, uh, and and more power to them. But they know deep down uh, uh, they're 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 in deep trouble if they start start planting Milo. So for the most part, they'll stay with their cotton. Don't look for a lot of increase. Certainly in the uh, northwest area, the Panhandle area, they'll they'll drop some cotton and put corn in that area. Right. That mm-hmm. Well, they did a little land. bit of that. Then they did a little bit of that this year, particularly because of primarily because of late planting. They couldn't get exactly. cotton in. Excellent point. That's yeah. point. So, so I think our plantings will be down. Uh, uh, maybe uh, belt wide, maybe as much as five percent, but I can see a. Uh, being down only two to three percent mm-hmm. wide, uh, but uh, if we get a nickel increase between now and Christmas, uh, maybe we plant all almost what we planted last year. The only the, the only the reduction I think may well be Texas. But here we are, uh, South Texas and coastal Bend is look excuse me looking to plant more cotton. Yes, yeah, they had a great year. Yeah, that, that's not going to offset the big. Uh, Giant uh, plains, but uh, that uh, that dry land crop can still come back and uh, give us more acreage uh, as we get get further down the pipeline. The the insurance price that 
that's more important to West Texas than anyone else. Uh, we've still got, what, two more months before we know that, or nearly three months mm-hmm. before that price is established, so lots of room. We we do need, I'm one that has said basically, you know, whatever impact we get from the tariff resolution for the most part is already built into this market. My, mm-hmm. my buddies tell me, no, there'll be a little more impact uh because a uh, resolution will guarantee that the cotton sales on the books to China will, in fact, be honored and not be canceled. Uh, that is significant. I, and I've forgotten the number now, maybe one and a half billion bales, uh, maybe a little larger. The number slips me, but it's still, it, it would be very difficult if we lost those, if those sales got canceled. So we do need to maintain those sales, and certainly a resolution would. Uh, signify that those sales are impacted. Sure, and, and that kind of leads to my next question because we as we know even even as we even as we speak, uh, we've got U.S. and Chinese delegates meeting again, trying to hash out these final details on this rumored Phase One agreement uh, for this trade dispute. But you know, as as we've all seen, you know, one day the news could be really optimistic and everybody's getting the ink pens ready for the signing ceremony, and the next day it sounds like everything's off the rails again. Uh, should we get this phase one agreement in place? Is cotton going to be part of that? All I keep hearing is are grains, soybeans, pork, uh, things like that. And if it if it is in place, that's great. If it's not, what's that? What kind of impact? might that have on cotton at this point? Well, I think, again, in my opinion, uh, first, most of my friends tell me there's a slight positive impact to come. Uh-huh. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's going to be very ill. It will not be much of an impact. Uh, in my opinion, China basically just does not need to import any more U.S. cotton or much. It right. has the cotton they need. Mm-hmm. And, and they, they did take a big chunk out of Brazil, from Brazil, and we started cautioning uh, that that was going to happen back at the Beltwide, and we're seeing that has actually come to fruition. And that's why they don't need so much U.S. cotton. Now, maybe they could come up with something that they decide to, to, to build their inventory in a significant way and take another billion or two billion bales. But uh, the price is certainly right for them to do that, and that would be the reason to do it, but I'm just not comfortable that they will do that, particularly since they're seeing a decline in their domestic consumption themselves. So I, I'm one to think that that uh, the, the tariff resolution is is only will be an only will only be a minor import impact on uh, for, for prices. Okay. We'll, it will be limited. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. Well, I always hope I'm wrong. We we, all, we we would all love to see you know cotton shoot back up to a dollar. You know, right. you know, right. on, on the heels of a of a great great agreement on that. But anyway, yes. uh, you know, optimism always abounds. You know this business. It, you know, yes, yes. We are we are and, a group of eternal optimists. Exactly, and there's a lot of optimism in the U.S. and, and, and thankfully so that the resolution is going to open the door to just tons and, and millions of bushels and bales mm-hmm. flowing into China. But again. Uh, China itself is somewhat of an orderly market, and while they may need this 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 production agricultural production in the U.S., they only need it on an orderly basis. And and and, and these huge sales I, I see coming, but over a period of eighteen twenty four months, uh, they, they, it just has to be an orderly sale. They can't use it immediately. They lost thirty three percent of their hog herd mm-hmm. worldwide. We're down. The worldwide uh, hog herds down 25%. So that takes a huge demand out of the soybean market. Sure, absolutely. Oh, wait, that's I, I appreciate your time. This has all been great. Um, and I want to thank you again, as always, for sharing your insight about the market. Uh, you and I will plan to catch up again uh, here pretty soon, probably at the Beltwide Conferences in January for sure. Look forward to seeing you and your girls there. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. We'll be right back with the rest of the Cotton Companion. Okay. We want to give a big thank you to Dr. Cleveland. Uh, it is a good thing we got this interview in right now uh, on the week of November 18 because in 12 days they will be playing the Egg Bowl, and I don't know that he is going to want to talk to me. I don't know that I'm going to want to talk to him after that. It's going to depend on the outcome of that game. Uh, so there will be a cooling off period maybe before we hear from uh, 
<laughs> oh, wait, I tell you what, the way both of our teams have been playing, we we should probably just decide not to watch it together and just go go eat at Little Dewey's or something. I think I already kind of left it with OA that, that I would catch up with him at Beltwide in January. So, you know, hopefully by then the sting will have worn off either either way. Uh, he uh, – he, I tell you, in years past, where he has spoken at our events at Beltwide, and Mississippi State has won, uh, there would yeah he gloated just a yeah, bit. Yeah, his he? chest was still puffed up a little bit, and I don't yeah. blame him for that. Uh, I'm sure he would say the same about me. So, uh, anyhow, we thank him as always. He's a great guy. He's a lot of fun, and nobody knows that market better than Dr. Cleveland. Okay, so that is going to just about do it for this installment of the Cotton Companion podcast. We want to thank our sponsor, Phytogen, uh, for sponsoring us. And we want to thank you, dear listener, uh, sincerely for joining us. If you like what you're hearing, please tell your farming buddies about us. Uh, They could get to our podcast in three easy ways. The first, go to cottongrower.com forward slash companion. The second, uh, they can subscribe to our iTunes channel or wherever it is that you are finding your podcast these days. Go ahead and sign up there. Leave us a rating. Let us know how we're doing. The third way to find this podcast, the best way to find it, is to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, the Cotton Grower e-news. You can do that by going to www.cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe, and you'll find a very uh, user-friendly mechanism to sign up for our e-newsletter. Also, please be sure to follow us on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter, and on Facebook, you can find us by simply searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. We hope that you're enjoying our latest issue, the aforementioned November seed issue. Uh, The December one is due in your mailboxes here in just a couple weeks. This podcast is produced by Mr. Tyler Hatch. He works at the Mothership Meister Media Worldwide in beautiful Willoughby, Ohio. Snowy Willoughby, Ohio. Yes, cold Willoughby, Ohio, (laughs) for sure. Uh, My name is Beck Barnes, and I'm going to be back with you in two weeks on the next episode of The Cotton Companion. For now, on behalf of my own cotton companion, Jim Stebman, we wish you and your farm all the best. Yeah, it works and it works and it works and it works and it works all day. God made a farm. Phytogen thanks you for listening to this edition of The Cotton Companion. To learn how you can thrive with Phytogen, go to phytogen.com. God.